subcommittee will come to order. The chairman notes presence of a quorum. Our guests can have a seat. Good morning. Today we will hear testimony on H.R. 511, a bill introduced by the distinguished gentleman from Florida, Congressman Tom Rooney, to list nine species of constrictor snakes under the Lacey Act. Let me say at the outset that I compliment my colleagues from the Florida delegation for their tireless commitment to restoring the Florida Everglades. But I have concerns that H.R. 511 will end up destroying hundreds of small businesses without providing any real benefit to the Everglades. Uh, by way of background, there are several key dates in this discussion. The first was June 23, 2006, when the South Florida Water Management District petitioned the Fish and Wildlife Service to list Burmese pythons on the Lacey Act. The next important date was January 20, 2010, when the Secretary of the Interior proposed to administratively list nine species of constrictor snakes. Before announcing a decision, however, the state of Florida implemented a law as of July 1, 2010, prohibiting the importation and personal possession of seven species of snakes, including Burmese pythons. Finally, after an exhaustive analysis by the Fish and Wildlife Service and the U.S. Small Business Administration of more than 56,000 comments, the Secretary of the Interior announced on January 17th of this year that four of the nine species, including the two species that have established populations in the Everglades, would be treated as injurious wildlife. It is now a violation of federal law to import and to move these four species in interstate commerce. Upon making the decision, Secretary of Salazar noted that it was intended to strike a balance between economic and environmental concerns. We're now being asked in H.R. 511 to go far beyond the recommendations of the South Florida uh, Water Management District, the State of Florida, and the Fish and Wildlife Service by listing all nine species of constrictor snakes. It is important to remember that millions of Americans own and have legally acquired constrictor snakes. They weren't smuggled into this country, while some of these Americans are simply content to have a boa constrictor as a pet, many others have created small businesses which breed them, feed them, provide equipment for them, sell them at pet stores, promote them at trade shows, provide veterinary care for them, and other activities which contribute millions to our economy. According to an economic analysis undertaken by the Georgetown Economic Services, the boa constrictor which was not listed by the Fish and Wildlife Service accounts for 70% of all imports and 70 to 80% of all revenues generated by these nine species. The service estimated that the annual decrease in economic output of these snakes ranged from $42 million to $86.2 million. In addition, the House Committee on Oversight held a hearing on the proposed listing of nine species and concluded in their report that over the first 10 years, combined loss could be between $505 million and $1.2 billion. A witness at the hearing, Mr. David Barker of Texas, an internationally recognized authority on constrictor snakes, stated that the, misgu in quotes, the misguided regulations will destroy an entire industry comprised almost exclusively of small and micro businesses. In short, if this rule goes into effect, it will destroy my life's work and investments for no rational reason, end quote. During the course of this hearing, I hope to learn why the current Florida state law and recent Interior Department rulings seem, in some people's minds, insufficient in addressing the Everglades problem. More specifically, does H.R. 511 protect current breeders, pet store owners, and small businesses who trade these species in Louisiana, Michigan, New York, and Washington State. Before recognizing the distinguished ranking minority member for any statement he would like to make, I would ask unanimous consent 
to submit for the record a segment of a report issued by the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform on the Fish and Wildlife Services Injured Species Proposed Rule, a letter written by the Small Business Administration's Office of Advocacy, an article entitled, in Environmental Temperatures, Physiology and Behavior Limit, the Range Expansion of Invasive Burmese Pythons in Southeastern USA, an article from the Chicago Tribune, and a petition signed by more than 150 residents of the state of Washington in opposition to H.R. 511. I am now pleased to recognize Congressman Sablon, uh, the gentleman from the Northern Marianas, and um, you're now recognized, sir, for five minutes. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for having this hearing today. Um, and welcome to all our guests. Good morning. Um, in my home in the Northern Mariana Islands, the brown tree snake is considered the number one threat to native wildlife. Natives excluding human beings at this time. But, uh, our Division of Fish and Wildlife had had to create an entire program dedicated to preventing the introduction of this snake to our islands. While this initiative requires constant monitoring and control, it is necessary to protect our natural heritage and fragile ecosystems against the spread of the brown tree snake. This invasive snake has also caused major economic and ecological damage on the island of Guam, where it has hunted more than 75% of native bird and leechwood species into extinction and causes frequent power outages. Similarly, preliminary studies have linked the Burmese python, a snake recently labeled an injurious species by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, to declines in mammal populations in the Florida Everglades. The five large constrictor snake considered by H.R. 511 are similar to the Burmese python, and unlike the brown tree snake, also pose a public safety threat because of their ability to grow to lands greater than 15 feet. Also, unlike the brown tree snake, some constrictor snakes are popular pets. The trade in exotic constrictor snake, snakes is widespread and helps support businesses that import, breed, and sell these and other reptiles. In considering legislation like HR 511, we need to pay careful attention to the balance between the marginal benefit of these few snake species to, provide to private businesses and the huge potential costs to society of established constrictor snake populations in the wild. I understand that the snakes that are subject to, are the subject of HR 511 could survive and create breeding populations in the wild if introduced to the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, as well as other US, U.S. insular areas and part of the Southern United States. Since the major limiting factor in survival and reproduction of these large snakes seem to be climate, it is likely that the amount of suitable habitat for them in the continental United States will expand with continued global warming. Tropical diseases like malaria and, and dengue fever already are gaining a foothold further and further north of the equator, and there is no reason to assume tropical reptiles, especially adoptable generalist predators like constrictor snakes, could not do the same. Finally, I'm also concerned about the amendment, the two amendments that the Judiciary Committee added to H.R. 511. The first would require that to be guilty of a Lacey Act violation related to any injurious species, any injurious species, not just these snakes, an individual would have to knowingly violate the Act. This requirement would severely hamper enforcement in general, but especially with respect to injurious snakes like zebra mussels that may be brought into the country in ship ballast water or by other similar means. We've had this debate on the Lacey Act in previous hearings. Challenge, char changing the prohibition in the statute from a strict liability offense to a knowing offense will remove the incentive for shippers to take steps such as appropriately cleaning ballast water and the outset of ships to ensure they don't bring these injurious animals into the United States. The Second Amendment would exempt animal exhib exhibitors as defined by the U.S. Department of Agriculture from the Lacey Act with respect to these snakes, even though USDA does not regulate reptiles. As we have seen before this year, when the majority was forced to put its proposed rewrite of the Lacey Act from the House floor, American citizens and businesses do not support attempts to weaken the Lacey Act. 
and I hope that after learning that lesson last summer, this committee will not support such attempts either. With that, I look forward to hearing from my witnesses and learning more about this issue. But at this time, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record the following materials. Testimony of the Humane Society of the United States, which includes documentation of over 240 dangerous incidents involving large constrictor snakes in 45 states, and testimony from the American Bird Conservancy, Conservancy supporting H.R. 511 as introduced by Mr. Rooney without the proposed amendments and then the, without objections. Without objection. Thank you very much and I yield back my time. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Thank my friend, a um, ranking member from the, for the minority. We'll now hear from our witnesses. Uh, like all witnesses, your written testimony will appear in full in the hearing record. So I ask that you keep your oral statements to five minutes as outlined in our invitation letter to you and under Committee Rule 4A. Our microphones are not automatic, so you'll need to uh, press the button. Uh, also, a common uh, mistake that, that's, that's made, we all make, is not being close enough to the microphone. So make sure uh, you're close enough, uh, pull it to you, and you may have to shift the microphones over to be heard well. We're now ready for our panel of public witnesses, which includes Dr. Brady Barr, the star of the National Geographic television show, Dangerous Encounters, Mr. John uh, Kostiak. Am I saying that correctly? Okay. Uh, Vice President, National Wildlife Federation, Mr. Sean Heflick, one of the stars of the television show, The Python Hunters. Uh, Ms. Colette Sutherland, who is known as the Snake Keeper from Spanish Fork, Utah. Mr. Peter Jenkins, Executive Director, Center for Invasive Species Prevention, and Mr. Andrew Wyatt, the President, United States Association of Reptile Keepers. Uh, your written testimony will appear in full in the hearing record, so I ask that you keep your oral statements to five minutes. Now, uh, we work on a uh, light and time system, so when you begin your testimony, You'll be under a green light. When the light turns yellow, you have a minute left. When it turns red, <clears throat> if you haven't completed your statement, please go ahead and wrap up. Otherwise, uh, I'll have to interrupt your statement. Your, your entire statement will be put into the record, so rest assured that. Uh, let's see. I guess first up is Dr. Barr. Uh, you're now recognized, sir, for five minutes. Uh, thank you. I'd like to thank the chair and the committee for uh, listening to me today. Um, you know, for the past few years, myself, like many of us, uh, saw many of the reports in the popular media, uh, reports that I thought were, were pretty sensationalized, and uh, finally decided I, I needed to contact USARC and, and offer up my expertise, because I really don't have any vested interest uh, in this decision. Um, I do feel... I'm National Geographic's resident herpetologist, a position I've held for the last 15 years, and uh, I think there are two uh, two items that need to be considered uh, in this situation. Uh, two controls, uh, one that uh, has been addressed, another that I haven't seen addressed. The first is is climatic controls. These these are tropical snakes that we're talking about. They're a long way from home. These snakes lack the the biology and the physiology. Uh, to survive low temperatures, and we're talking about temperatures that uh, you know would, would be below 16 degrees Celsius. That's approximately 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And when uh, these types of temperatures uh, are experienced by these snakes, uh, they have trouble digesting prey. They have uh, trouble acquiring prey. They have trouble moving. Uh, avoiding predation, uh, and the bottom line is they have trouble surviving at low temperatures. Uh, these animals are ectotherms, meaning that they cannot internally control their body temperature. Uh, they have to rely on the environment for their for their body temperature. So, uh, you know, I think in summary, due to, to the climatic controls, when it gets cold, these snakes die, and that will prevent any movement northward. Uh, along the eastern seaboard of the U.S. The second important point uh, or control uh, that I think that should be considered is a biological control, and I haven't 
seen this issue addressed. Uh, in, in the Everglades or in the state of Florida, there's estimated over or 2 million American alligators. And alligators are a keystone species in the Everglades. Uh, they're an apex predator. They're one of the largest non-marine predators on the planet. And in saying that, uh, alligators found in the Everglades are undersized. Uh, they grow very slowly. They reach sexual maturity uh, later than populations elsewhere. Uh, to a large degree, it's been surmised that that owes to a poorer quality diet found in the Everglades. The Everglades is a tough place to, to live if you're, a, if, you, if you're a large predator. Um, it's, it's an ecosystem characterized by a dramatic dry season and wet season. Um, there aren't a lot of prey items in the Everglades for top predators uh, to utilize. Uh, in the 90s, 1992 to 1997, I uh, uh, undertook the most comprehensive diet study of American alligators uh, to date. And in Everglades National Park, I captured and flushed the stomachs of over 2,000 alligators and found the top prey item to be snakes. Uh, essentially, alligators are surviving on snakes in the Everglades. 55% uh, of recovered food mass is snake. Uh, these animals are making an existence almost solely on snakes. And this is in an environment which I said is, is uh, not wealthy in terms of suitable prey for large predators such as alligators. Uh, so I think that uh, any inclusion of exotic snakes, the top prey item of alligators, will be utilized uh, by that apex predator. So in conclusion, I feel that, that you know, climatic controls and biological controls in predators on these exotic snakes, and alligators is just one example of many found in the Everglades, uh, will prevent uh, movement of these snakes northward and uh, thereby doesn't merit inclusion in the Lacey Act of these species. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you Mr. Barr, Dr. Barr, and uh, thank you for your testimony. And uh, Mr. Kostiak, uh, you're next up, sir. You're recognized for five minutes. So. Uh, good morning, uh, and thank you, uh, Chairman Fleming. Uh, no, I think you just turned me off. I did do it again. Okay. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, National Wildlife Federation is the nation's, nation's largest conservation education and advocacy organization. We have over 4 million members and supporters. We have 48 state and territorial affiliates. And uh, we are passionate about conserving wildlife and habitat and addressing the chief threats to wildlife and habitat. And we see invasive species, and the science has shown that invasive species are indeed one of the chief threats. Um, we would like to thank Chairman, uh, uh, Congressman Rooney, Rooney for introducing uh, H.R. 511. Uh, we think banning importation and interstate trade of those nine large constrictor snakes is the right thing to do. They were found to be, all nine were found to be injurious by the Fish and Wildlife Service. The Fish and Wildlife Service decision to take five of them off the list was, uh, was actually a decision made by OMB uh, based upon non-scientific grounds. Um, and uh, USGS also has supported that finding. Um, we see the uh, large constrictor uh, snake problem is a major threat to wildlife. I'd like to talk to you uh, uh, further about the benefits of the bill as introduced, but I would like to flag uh, the two uh, mem harmful amendments that were brought onto the bill in the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, the first, uh, they, they both essentially negate the value of the bill as introduced, unfortunately. The uh, first one, which allows unregulated exhibitors of, uh, of snakes to uh, evade the Lacey Act uh, prohibitions, essentially uh, guts the, the original law. And uh, the Second Amendment is even more damaging because it goes well beyond injurious uh, snakes to all injurious uh, species listed as injurious and essentially creates a burden of proof that makes the law uh, virtually impossible to enforce and therefore elim eliminates its deterrent effect. Um, and so that would be a major setback to our most important law for uh, controlling and uh, preventing the introduction of invasive species. 
Uh, so turning to H.R. 511, I'd like to just list three uh, chief benefits of the law, law as introduced. Uh, first of all, the wildlife benefits. This uh, uh, law really is a, a crucial step to protecting this nation's rich natural heritage, and not just Florida. We have uh, seen the Burmese python uh, invading uh, Florida, and uh, this was brought in by the pet, in pet industry and released into the wild, and now numbers somewhere between 30,000 and 100,000 snakes. And they're now so well established that many scientists are questioning whether eradication will ever happen. Uh, more than 25 different bird species, including uh, several endangered species, have been found in the digestive tracts of the snake. And now we find, uh, through this recent study has shown, that uh, the python is eliminating vast portions of the uh, native mammals of that region. That level of ecosystem disruption is a major threat to Everglades restoration, a project in which state and federal taxpayers have invested billions of dollars. The scientific community has sounded the alarm about these nine large constrictor snakes. They've shown that they could expand their range well beyond South Florida, into the southern portion of the continental U.S., as well as the island territories. Scientists have already observed that the python populations have rebounded from cold snaps, well below 16 degrees centigrade, defying, defying all the predictions we have heard about die-offs due to cold snaps. Louisiana, the home of Chairman Fleming, appears to have, according to these reports, a climate that is well suited for the establishment of large constrictor snakes. Now, of course, the, all the projections we have seen, and by the way, you hear lots of disputes about climate change science in the media, but the scientific community ha is only disagreeing uh, to the extent of degree and not whether there is a fact of warming. A warming a trend happening in this country is not disputed in the scientific community. The warming trend is well underway, and that will expand the range of large constrictor snakes. I'd like to talk briefly about the economic benefits. My organization is comprised of hunters and anglers, wildlife watchers, and we are deeply concerned about the tourism and recreation industry and the impacts of the arrival of large constrictor snakes. No one knows to this day how badly Florida has already been hit. Uh, how many families are not willing to go into the Everglades and spend money due to the arrival of these snakes. How many hunters have lost a, 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 a prey base? The list goes on. It, it, it's something that ought to be considered by the members of this committee. And finally, human safety. We, are, we know 17 lives have already been lost due to large constrictor snakes in this country. This, uh, this Lacey Act uh, protection is essential. There's no reason for it. One single additional loss of life to continue uh, when Congress has the power to rein in invasive species. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kostiak. Uh, Mr. Heflick, you're up, sir, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear and speak before you. Um, my name is Sean Heflick, uh, and my interest in this hearing and subject matter is multifaceted. I'm a biologist who's completed his master's degree on invasive species in Florida. We've traveled the world capturing and studying pythons, anacondas, and bows on five continents. I'm the president of a conservation NGO out of the Amazon Basin, a licensed python agent for both the Everglades National Park and Florida Wildlife Commission, and the host of National Geographic Wild series of Python Hunters, which explores um, exactly this topic. Um, the question today is whether several species of snakes should be added to the Lacey's Act list of injurious species and whether the listing would further the restoration of the Everglades? My answer is simple, no. Why? Multiple reasons. First, no anaconda or reticulated python populations exist in the United States, even though these animals have been here for half a century. In addition, there's a glaring lack of data for any negative impact of the existing wildlife <coughs> or wild Burmese python populations. The alleged severe mammal decline in South Florida due to the, the Burmese python population is, in my professional opinion, a travesty of science, especially when the data tell an entirely different story. Natural hydrological cycles, effects of high mercury levels, fire regimes, general water pollution, increased alligator population, increased scavenger populations, increased mesopredator populations, increased vehicle traffic, Two record low winters with hard freezes, changes in man-made water regimes, 
a huge, massive increase in feral cat populations, estimated at 10 to 15 million in the state of Florida. <clears throat> Among many other potential causes, totally unaccounted for in this study. Totally unaccounted for in the study. In fact, two of the authors of the study, who I know, openly stated that they believe the real reason for the decline in mammals is the depressed hydrological cycle within the Everglades National Park. From first-hand boots-on-the-ground experience, I can take you to the Everglades today and show you more signs of small mammals in one day and evening than this entire study of eight years exhibited. Something is grossly wrong with that disparity. Snakes are temperature sensitive. With permitting from Florida Wildlife Commission and collaborative from the USDA, APHIS, I conducted a study in 2010 during the hard freeze, which included both boa constrictors and Burmese pythons. Within just four days, four days, 100% of all of those constrictor snakes in that outdoor enclosure had died due from exposure. Simply put, the outside ambient temperature had dropped below the python and boa's critical thermal minimum, which caused death. Environmental temperatures, physiological and behavioral limits, or limits, sorry, the range expansion of these Burmese pythons in southeastern United States. This also offers insight as to why the Burmese population has not expanded outside of South Florida in almost two decades and is seemingly, by the numbers, on the decline since 2009 and 2010 cold snap. Furthermore, from January 1st, 2012 to the present, 71 Fish and Wildlife Commission Python agents have captured a total of only 46 pythons for this entire calendar year. The population numbers are indeed lower, and the numbers prove it. Sorry. Uh-oh. No worries. The same thermal data is applicable to the rest of these proposed tropical species and would severely limit their ability to survive. The competition for resources and prey items is immense, and the idea that the rep a reptile predator in the system is not novel. The Everglades is not a paradise for invading tropical pythons or boas. On the contrary, it is a harsh, subtropical environment that is riddled with predators, roadways, vehicles, pollutants, and an ever-increasing pressure from human development. Last year I participated on a panel for invasive species at an academic conference with partners in reptile conservation where I asked university biologists, state biologists, fish and game enforcement, zoo curators, reptile industry experts, Department of Interior biologists, if any one of them thought boa constrictors were invasive species and could possibly pose a problem in the United States. Not one of these field experts raised their hand. Not one of these experts who work day in and day out with these issues on the ground believe them to be a problem. The same sentiment can be found among biologists and ecologists for reticulated pythons and green anacondas as well. These are not the invasive monsters that they are portrayed to be. And crippling thousands of small businesses and family breeders will accomplish nothing to save the Everglades. Thank you for your time. Yes. Thank you. Um, and uh, next, uh, Ms. Southern, you um, are recognized now for five minutes. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I'm Colette Sutherland, and along with my husband Dan, own TSK Incorporated, also known as the Snake Keeper, a small family business with five full-time and three part-time employees. Here we maintain approximately a thousand snakes, a rodent colony, and a reptile-related supply business. I am also a member of the Pet Industry Joint Advisory Council's Reptile and Amphibian Committee. Thank you for inviting me to present testimony on the HR 511 bill that would add five additional species of constrictor snakes to the Lacey Act. 
I have been keeping and breeding various types of reptiles for the past 40 years. I have a zoology degree from Brigham Young University. My written testimony references several of my publications, including providing 10 years of production data as the basis for Dr. Morell's doctoral thesis on quantitative genetic analysis of reproductive traits in ball pythons. With respect to HR 511, I have serious concerns about the approach being taken. Listing a species in the Lacey Act by legislative fiat is not, in my opinion, the best course for dealing with federal regulation of an invasive species, especially when the invasive issue is localized at, at best in southern Florida. The listing process currently employed by the Fish and Wildlife Service, while possibly in need of revision, at least is founded upon science-based findings. The process is open to public comment, peer review, and potential modification via the regulatory process. The Fish and Wildlife Service has already listed four species and deferred making a final decision with respect to five non-native constrictor species because it did not believe that their listing was warranted. I believe that the service is in the best position to make such findings. I am opposed to nationwide ban of any species whose potential negative impact at best is limited to extremely localized areas such as South Florida. Adding the boa constrictor would be most devastating to the reptile industry. Boas are produced by the thousands by commercial and non-commercial breeders such as our company throughout the United States. There is a tremendous variety of size and color even among the normally colored specimens. Boas are one of the most commonly kept large constrictor species in the world. In, 2000, in the year 2000, we added boas to our collection. Conservatively, we have invested a minimum of $300,000 in acquiring a breeding colony. We have invested thousands in caging supplies and maintenance of our breeding operations. We sell our, our offspring throughout the United States as well as sport animals to other countries. With just the talk of having boas added to Lacey Act, the value of our bow collection was devastated. Snakes I had paid $25,000 a pair for, I could barely sell for $1,500 as a breeding adult. Their progeny, which had been selling for approximately $7,500 each, prior to the proposed listing, plummeted to $1,500 or even less if I could find a buyer at all. We had to make a very hard business decision as well as a heartbreaking decision. After trying to market our adult bullets to other breeders in states that would have been allowed to export them, because there is no port in my state, so I never would have been able to allow to export them, it became apparent that there were no buyers. We even tried to give some of the adults away, and nobody wanted or was willing to accept them due to the potential talk of the ban. We ended up euthanizing over 60 adult boas. We still maintain some boas, but n not nearly what we once had, and we were considered a medium-sized breeder. In assessing the financial loss we incurred, Dan and I figured out the potential production of viable progeny had we been able to keep those breeding animals intact. Without augmenting the breeding stock, we conservatively estimated those 60 breeders over their natural breeding lifespan and normal birth rates could have generated approximately $2 million had the market not collapsed in light of the potential ban. This, I know there's been a lot of talk about it only affects a small percentage of small businesses, but I am one of those small businesses. And we have been involved in this since I've, for at least 30 years, breeding and selling the snakes. And I'm not the only one. There's hundreds of us across the U.S. that do this, and we all work very hard and responsibly to make sure we're providing a good product and that we tell the purchasers, we, we give them guidelines and expect them to take care of their animals and be responsible keepers. And I don't see the need to have a nationwide ban when this is totally a localized situation in South Florida. Thank you for allowing me the time to speak to you today. Thank you, Ms. Southern. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, now, Mr. Jenkins, you're recognized, sir, for five minutes. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks for the opportunity to testify today. <clears throat> I'm testifying as a consultant working through my firm, the Center for Invasive Species Prevention, consulting for the National Environmental Coalition on Invasive Species, or NESIS, 
NESIS includes the National Wildlife Federation, John's organization, the, the Nature Conservancy, the Wildlife Society, Great Lakes United, National Audubon, and many other groups. Given the short notice for this hearing, my full testimony, which I've submitted, hasn't been approved as NESIS testimony, but the positions I'm going to advocate are the NESIS positions. <coughs> When the Fish and Wildlife Service listed the four snake species at the beginning of this year, it basically violated the Lacey Act in that decision by excluding the five other species for reasons that had nothing to do with the Lacey Act and the statute. That is the problem that H.R. 511 can fix if the two bad amendments are removed that uh, John Kostiak referred to. The statutory standard that the service's listing should have followed was not to weigh the benefits versus the revenue losses of, of uh, Ms. Sutherland and others, um, from a possible Lacey Act listing, it would decide simply whether the snakes fit the definition of an injurious species under the Act. That definition is, and I quote, are they injurious to human beings, to the interests of agriculture, horticulture, forestry, or to wildlife or the wildlife resources of the United States, end quote. It's abundantly clear that all nine of these large constrictor snakes meet that standard. Let me address the five snakes that weren't listed. We know for a fact that the Fish and Wildlife Service, as was mentioned by Mr. Sablon, the Fish and Wildlife Service wanted to list all nine of the species. They felt it was scientifically the right decision, but they were compelled by OMB to cut the list back to the four species. Why? Because OMB apparently got persuaded by USARC's claims that Mr. Wyatt's going to talk about, I'm sure, which um, are about lost revenues, which is fine, but it's against the statutory standard that I just mentioned. Boa constrictors, which we've heard a lot about, which were excluded from listing due to OMB, have already invaded at least twice in South Florida, or at least twice in this country, and are high risk, according to the USGS. We just received confirmation last night from leading uh, scientific experts with USGS and university scientists that there is a rapidly expanding invasion of boa constrictors now in Puerto Rico. People have known about this invasion, but we weren't clear on how serious it was and there should be new evidence published within the next week or two in peer-reviewed journals of, that we're not just talking about a South Florida problem. It's not a localized problem. It's a problem for South Texas, Puerto Rico, any semi-tropical area in this country, the island territories, you name it, boa constrictors can easily and readily invade there and they have in Puerto Rico. So let's get off that this is a localized South Florida problem. Uh, reticulated pythons were also excluded because of OMB pressure from that listing. The thing about reticulated pythons, we don't have evidence of invasions yet, but we know that they are known as particularly vicious animals. They're prone to unprovoked attacks, and in their native ranges, it's reported they're occasional man-eaters. Reticulated pythons in this country have killed more infants than any other snake, including an 11-month-old boy, a 21-month-old boy, and a seven-month-old girl in her crib. Um, the other three OMB excluded species were the anacondas. Now, is there anyone in this hearing room who really believes that we need anacondas as pets in this country? OMB's inter interference was extremely unfortunate also because U.S. Arc's lost revenue claims are grossly inflated and unrealistic. Georgetown Economic Services, which you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, which did the U.S. Arc reptile study, is a subsidiary of the law firm that represents Mr. Wyatt's organization. Of course it's a biased study. Its findings were severely critiqued by outside economists, including Tim Kroger, an economist with the Nature Conservancy. According to Dr. Kroger's statement, which I'd like to hand in for the record, um, uh, Mr. Wyatt's study has serious flaws. Uh, Dr. Kroger identifies so many biased assumptions and errors of facts and misstatements in that study that it's too long to list here, but they are included in my written testimony. Some other key points, if I may. Um, at least 750 different reptile species are in the animal import trade in the U.S. If H.R. 511 passes, then the reptile importers and breeders face losing up, uh, up to only five species. That's less than 1% of the total of the reptile trade. There are numerous safer, non-invasive species that can substitute for those lost five, and they will. They are doing it. The pet industry is highly adaptable. The snake breeders generally do import and breed lots of other species besides the large constrictors, so they can and will adjust their operations. I'd just like to finish on the important point that we, was mentioned of the 17 deaths that have occurred across the nation due to these snakes that these breeders are selling in this country. Uh, these have an economic value, not to mention the incredible 
hardship and tragedy that these families and children who are um, who are involved in these in these deaths suffer. So. Um, U.S. ARC's approach seems to be to just ignore this and say, buyer beware, oh, everyone's got to take care of the problem on their own. But what about the children and the infants who are strangled in their cribs? How are they supposed to be aware of this problem? This is real. This is a real part of the injuriousness standard. It's not just about South Florida. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, sir, you're out of time. Okay, thank, thank you for your much. testimony. I uh, now recognize Mr. Wyatt for five minutes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, good morning. My name is Andrew Wyatt, and I'm the CEO and President of the United States Association of Reptile Keepers. We're an organization representing breeders, manufacturers, collectors, and scientists who work in the reptile industry. Many of our members are small business owners or sole proprietors. The modern reptile industry has grown and been established as a legitimate cottage industry that pumps approximately $1.4 billion per year into the U.S. economy. Herpticulture refers to the ownership and breeding of captive reptiles and amphibians. It evolved from the import and trade of inexpensive pet store animals into a sophisticated, non-traditional agricultural pursuit, a pursuit that has continued to thrive to provide jobs and to stimulate the U.S. economy even in the face of recent economic downturns. Our members provide high-quality captive-bred reptiles to zoos, aquariums, research facilities, educators, TV and film, and the pet industry. Some specimens sell for tens of thousands of dollars. <clears throat> Pythons and boas have been here for decades in well-established captive breeding programs. Our main issue is with interstate transport and the negative impact on thousands of well-established small businesses engaged in herpticulture. Illegalizing the trade of these incredibly valuable animals across state lines would destroy jobs and livelihoods. This is the real job killer that Oversight Committee Chairman Issa referred to during his hearing on the federal rule as an example of an overzealous bureaucratic response that is the result of politically motivated or biased science. H.R. 511 or prior versions of it, have been debated for about five years now. The Obama administration enacted a partial rule last January that was initiated in early 2008 by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The U.S. Geological Survey, science, the, the unsound foundation upon which this bill is based, is widely seen as weak and controversial within the scientific community. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service did no cost-benefit analysis, the Congressional Budget Office report on H.R. 511 never made mention of the economic impact to small business owners working in herpticulture, despite the fact that Georgetown Economic Services, the only folks who bothered to do any kind of economic research into this, did a comprehensive report on the rep reptile industry in 2011. According to GES, listing these nine constricting snakes on the injurious wildlife list of the Lacey Act would cost small businesses as much as $104 million in the first year and as much as $1.2 billion over the next 10 years. This action has been opposed by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the Small Business Administration, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, the Pet Industry Joint Advisory Council, and the United States Association of Reptile Keepers. The argument by the administration that invasive Burmese pythons are experiencing a continued population increase and are poised to expand their range across the southern third of the United States is not supported by evidence. A single USGS report erroneously suggests python populations could expand from the southern tip of Florida to the San Francisco Bay. The population of pythons actually peaked in summer 2009 and then crashed in the winters of 2009-2010. The decline in python numbers since the 2009 peak has been significant. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission believes 30 to 50 percent of the remaining wild Burmese python population died in January and February of 2010. A newly published study in integrative zoology by Dr. Elliot Jacobson et al. is a collaboration of the University of Florida, USDA, and real python experts. It calls into question the fundamental premise of the USGS climate work that pythons can migrate out of South Florida and across the southern third of the U.S. This peer-reviewed paper published in September 2012 confirms what at least four other studies have also demonstrated. 
And I quote, it appears unlikely that the Burmese pythons inhabiting the Everglades will be capable of expanding or becoming established far beyond southern Florida. The majority opinion indicates that in the wake of the python population collapse, the remnant population of feral Burmese pythons in South Florida cannot survive north of Lake Okeechobee. Subtropical low temperatures, even in South Florida, are lethal to tropical pythons. They are not physiologically able to survive the cold and cannot survive in more temperate areas of the country. Simply put, when temperatures drop, pythons die. If there are lessons to be learned here, there are, they are as follows. Number one, science is a tool to provide insight for solving complex problems, not a justification for arbitrary and capricious government action to satisfy ideological goals. Number two, government's role in private business is to protect free market competition, not to pick winners or losers based on popular preference. The Lacey Act is in dire need Number three, the Lacey Act is in dire need of fundamental reform to be of any real conservation value. In closing, H.R. 511 is a job-killing bill that preempts the rights of states to manage their own citizens and affairs by seeking to ban the importation and interstate transport of nine species of constricting snakes. It's a nanny state legislation at its worst and will bankrupt thousands of small businesses and cost our economy more than $100 million per year. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Mr. Wyatt. Um, thank you panel for your statements. Uh, at this point we will begin member questioning of the witnesses to allow all members to participate and to ensure we can hear from all of our witnesses today. Members are limited to five minutes for their questions. However, if members have additional questions, uh, we can have more than one round of questioning and usually do. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Dr. Barr, you, um, I understand you are a biologist uh, yeah, go ahead and move that to you because I have several questions for you. Uh, you're, you have a Ph.D. in biology. That is correct. Um, <clears throat> you know, <laughs> I wish I had a dollar for every, I used to say a dime, but with inflation I say a dollar now. Uh, I wish I had a dollar for every bill that we have testimony in which somebody claims that global warming is the reason why we should move forward on the legislation. Um, the truth is there's a consensus out there right now that regardless of what may have happened before, over the past 16 years we've had temperature stability uh, for our globe. So I think the worry, the threat that uh, in the next few years we're going to have reptiles on our doorsteps here in Washington, D.C. is really a little bit overblown. Uh, I think our national debt of $16.3 trillion dollars is uh, certainly much more immediate. But my question to you is this. Uh, I heard you mention ectothermal. Snakes are ectothermal, uh, reptiles are. Uh, we used to say cold-blooded, warm-blooded. Is that pretty much the same thing? Ectothermal would be cold-blooded, uh, what we used to call cold-blooded, and uh, warm-blooded would be what endothermal? That's correct. So that means that uh, snakes, reptiles in general, have great difficulty regulating their body temperature and they're very subject to fluctuations in temperatures in the environment. That is correct. So, um, so as I understand it today, what we're saying is that if temperatures approach uh, 60 degrees and lower, that not only does uh, a snake have difficulty eating and moving, because as those temperatures drop, he has more difficulty surviving, digesting and what have you, but it's unlikely to survive. That, is that, that correct? That is correct. So, um, that being the case, um, it, it really seems that whatever threat may be in Florida, that there's very little worry that that threat is going to occur anywhere else. As I understand it, we're talking about the Everglades, which is something, how many miles? Uh, 80 miles south of Miami. So we're talking about the very southern tip of the United States. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, those that are supposed to be invasive species in the Everglades, how did they get there? That, that is a good question. I do not know. Uh, the media would have us believe that pet owners are turning their snakes out. Perhaps someone even in Utah may load their snakes up in a van, I guess and drive down to the Everglades to dump them. Is, do we have evidence of that? No, that seems unlikely. 
Okay. So would it be more likely that such snakes, uh, such reptiles would get there perhaps through more conventional ways that we see invasive species, perhaps on board uh, a water vessel or something like that that's just simply accidental? That is a possibility. Okay. Um, so I, I certainly think that before we go after pet shops and pet owners that we should consider those things. Um, what has been, again, Dr. Barr, what has been the impact of the Lacey Act listing of the Burmese pythons and the three other constrictor snake species by the Obama administration earlier this year? Uh, are you asking in terms of the scientific community or uh, the television community? Uh, Mr. I'd yeah, be, Mr. I'd, White, you, you... Yes, sure. I'd be happy to elaborate on that. What has happened, not only with the, the four snakes that were actually listed uh, by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, but de facto the five that have been left dangling out there with a, a, with a partial rule having been made, but the final disposition of the remaining five has put the industry under incredible pressure. And uh, the, the animals that have, have actually been listed have all but lost all value and people have been going bankrupt and forced to make hard decisions about what to do with their animals. And even with the animals that, that were not listed, like Ms. Sutherland said, you know, the, the value of these animals dropped. If you're a, if you're a rancher in uh, Louisiana and uh, you're, you're told one day that you can no longer sell your cattle out of Louisiana, that you can only sell them within the state, then it's going to be, put you in a very difficult position, and you're going to have to make some hard business decisions on how to feed those animals and take care of those animals when you have now lost all value. Mm -hmm. So certainly it's been a significant negative impact on small businesses during a time that we can least afford it with our economy being the way it is. Uh, well, I thank you, and uh, the chair now yields to uh, Mr. Sablon, uh, the ranking member, for five minutes for questions. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. If there's no objection, I'd like to, Ms. Bordalio has something to go to, and I'll yield my five minutes to her, and then I'll take her time when it's... Uh... Okay, uh, thank you, sir. Ms. Bordalio. I thank the ranking member, Sablon, for yielding his time, and also to you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like to underscore the importance of addressing invasive species issues early. Given the experience that we had on the territory of Guam with the brown tree snake, although they are not a public safety hazard, the invasion by these snakes has led to changes in our environment, destroying native bird, bat, and lizard populations, and leading to changes throughout the ecosystem. The economic impact is also high. Every year, the federal government must spend millions and millions of dollars preventing the spread of snakes to other islands, as well as on programs to restore habitats and, and other to recover species. Now, while the presence of the brown tree snake on Guam has been devastating, there is no reason to believe that the presence of giant constrictor snakes may be far more destructive. We on Guam wish attention and oversight had been paid to invasive species before the introduction of the brown tree snake. Invasive species are a problem that should be addressed early or else spend decades and millions of dollars on eradication programs. Now I have a couple of questions for Mr. Kostiak. Uh, Mr. Wyatt and Dr. Barr both assert, and this is what the uh, chairman was, was talking about, both assert that when temperatures drop, pythons die. Well, couldn't they do other things like move or adapt or take shelter? And also, Mr. Heflick also mentions that last year, only 46 invasive Burmese pythons were caught in Florida. Now, don't you think that there are more in number, given that they are naturally camouflaged and good at hiding, and that a female can lay over 100 eggs? Thank you for the question, uh, Congresswoman. Uh, we have been in uh, daily conversation with the leading researchers on this subject, the folks who have collected all of the, the, the field data. And what they tell us is that, yes, there is a die-off when you have a cold snap, uh, but let's say that die-off results in 30% mortality. Uh, what happens to that remaining 70%? And that is the answer to your question, which is those uh, snakes have uh, found a way to survive, and it's generally through hibernation or basking or, or, or some other behavioral action that enables them to avoid that die-off. And so that is a well-known biological phenomenon, 
It uh, applies to tropical snakes, it applies to other snakes, and this is how snakes survive all, all across the continental U.S. They have these abilities uh, to get underground and get safe. And so there's absolutely no reason to believe that these uh, pythons are limited to southern Florida. The USGS, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the agencies that are charged with leading our federal government's presence on science and wildlife science are unanimous in saying that these species are injurious and that their uh, range extends beyond South Florida, their potential range. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the other one is to you, Mr. Jenkins. I have just one quick question. What percent of the reptile market do these snakes represent? Is there evidence that people could find good substitutes and that businesses would not be severely harmed? Uh, thank you, Mrs. Bardio. That, um It's a great question. appreciate it. Um, and as I said in my statement, there are at least 750 different reptile species that are imported in the entire reptile trade. Now we're talking about limiting maybe five total, but only two or three of those are actually important commercially. Um, there are many safer alternatives, and that's what this legislation is all about. That's what the Lacey Act is all about. It doesn't even prohibit in-state ownership. It doesn't prohibit people from owning these snakes. It just says we're going to slowly wean these species out of the system by prohibiting international imports and interstate commerce. So there are many alternatives. It's a very slow-acting law. It gives uh, Ms. Sutherland and her business time to react, time to look at the alternatives. And we know from her website that they already breed several other snake species that are um, perfectly approved and, and, and not a problem. So we're talking about limiting a small portion of their business. These are adaptable businesses. They can go to other species. Thank you very much. And I want to thank the ranking member, Mr. Sablon, for yielding his time. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. Uh, Mr. Sutherland is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Kosiak, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, uh, you made reference to um, the amendments. Um, in, in your second, uh, the second amendment that you made reference to, um, you had an issue with uh, the, the, the difficulty or the burden that the government would have to prove someone guilty. Um, that is a fundamental disagreement that I have with your problem. In this country, you are innocent until you are proven guilty. And so, I, I, I'm, I explain that. Why, why should it be easy for the government, which has proven not to be able to regulate itself very well, have an easier time of violating the civil rights or any rights, legal rights, of any citizen in this country. And why should that be, why should that bar be lessened or lowered? Thank you for the opportunity to elaborate, um, Congressman. The, uh, I am, I am a, a, an attorney, um, and uh, for a good number of years I was uh, in, working in the judiciary and as well as in private practice. And uh, environmental laws have different standards of proof. Um, there is virtually no environmental law that says the only way to hold somebody accountable is to prove that they knew they were in violation of the law. Um, that is the knowing standard that was imposed by the Judiciary Committee. If you talk to anybody who prosecutes any law, they say that essentially takes us off of the ball field. And uh, now, if there's a civil, if there's an opportunity for civil uh, enforcement, uh, that would have a lower uh, burden of proof, and then put the knowing standard at the criminal side. Uh, that would be one thing. But if the only tool you have in, in your toolbox is an uh, is a, uh, enforcement of the law by proving that somebody knew they were in violation of the law, uh, that essentially makes it virtually impossible to enforce. Now, I don't, I don't, I don't, and I disagree with you on that. I, I think, uh, and I'm not an attorney, um, but uh, God knows I've paid enough of them uh, in, in, in my lifetime um, in our businesses, but um, to try to protect us. Uh, from overzealous regulators. Uh, all of our congressional offices are pounded uh, each week about how the EPA, for example, uh, does not have the burden of proof, and they are absolutely 
in my opinion, the, the, the greatest threat to free enterprise in America today. And uh, so, um, but that's that's not why we're here. So, I, I, but I appreciate. It. I mean, I I disagree with you in in, in, in that regard. One of the things I'm I'm interested in and in, in coming over, um, I guess, Mr. Jenkins. Um, I'm I'm interested in. You represent a lot of different organizations, and and you made in your testimony you were concerned about the 17 fam the 17 deaths and the families that that have experienced these deaths and um, you you uh, seem very sympathetic to them. I'm curious of your organizations that uh, you represent. Uh, what kind of of efforts have your groups uh, been involved in to expand? Um, hunting season for white-tailed deer uh, because I know obviously we have you know hunting seasons that that, that vary from state to state to state um, but you know I don't know if too many hunters that wouldn't like a couple extra days are you I mean in your organizations is there an effort to expand and I'm going somewhere with this and I know I've got one minute but um, uh, do you know of efforts well, thank you for the question my organization only focuses on invasive species prevention. I do consulting with these other groups, so I can't speak for them on the white-tailed deer and hunting season and right. all that sort of thing. It's a great topic, but I'm going to, if well, I can, turn it over to Mr. Kostiak because he knows more about it. Okay. Go ahead. So if your question is, we recognize that there is in some places uh, overpopulation of white-tailed deer and additional hunting uh, may be necessary, is that your... Well, I I'm wanting you to be consistent, and, and I'm finding that from so many, and I've got 30 seconds, so I'll just summarize where I'm going here. Uh, in, 2000, in two thousand, year 2000, there were uh, 247,000 automobile accidents uh, with white-tailed deer, uh, resulting in over 200 human deaths. I've not heard any environmental organization coming in here with the premise that you just laid before this panel today, expanding deer season, and, and I've never heard an environmentalist come in here and have any concern at all for the 200 families that had to bury their loved ones because of overpopulated deer well, uh, herds. My it's organization does have that concern. I'm sorry? We do share your concern about that. In yeah. fact, we have a large number of hunters within our organization who work uh, at the state level where uh, the seasons are set, not at the federal level. Uh, to make sure that the right length of season is established. And so well, that, but, but, but one could surmise that, that if we've got 247, I mean, 200 people dying in one year from, from accidents, that the, the hunting seasons aren't long enough. Are you advocating, I mean, those organizations advocating for longer hunting season? Oftentimes they do. Yes, I, I mean, you, I would uh, refer you to Florida Wildlife Federation, our state affiliate, who works on those issues on a daily basis uh, to know, you know, there's a lot of science that goes behind setting the seasons. And uh, that is an important question, but it's not typically something that Congress wrestles with. No, I... I we're going to keep going. Okay, the gentleman's time is up. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Sublime for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I, I always... I like Tom Rooney, and I always... Now I know exactly why. And um, I, I must say this much, that he would not have gone to the trouble of developing this bill and introducing it if he had no serious concerns about this snakes in Florida. Um, and Mr. Chairman, I have very high regards also for my chairman here, but again, if anybody has any question about climate change, if anybody questions the scientific facts, I have a place in Micronesia where I'm from. Come over, I'll show you about climate change, about rising sea levels, and the change it's making to the islands. Um, and 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 you, if you don't know the science, then I have the physical evidence. But I, I'm and I'm going to stick to the issue here. Uh, Mr. Costia, did I say that correct? Um, yeah, and you're the lawyer, so I'm going to be careful here with my questions now. <laughs> Why is it so important that we prevent non-native species from being introduced in the first place? Um, the Lazy Act. It's, it's an important tool to prevent biological invasions. And can you speak to why the addition of the knowingly amendment to this bill by the Judiciary Committee harms wildlife, taxpayers, and the economy? Thank you for the opportunity to elaborate on this because really this hearing is going to the basic question is are we going to have a Lacey Act that has any 
uh, ability to protect this country. If you think if we were sitting in the House Armed Services Committee and we were debating whether or not to have a no-fly zone for terrorists, there would be no dispute whatsoever. They represent a threat, a harm to this country, and we have a right as a country to defend our borders and a duty to defend our borders. It's the same issue with the Lacey Act. We have scientists who go through very rigorous processes to reach the conclusion that species are injurious to this country and um, put forward that decision and therefore we have a, a duty to follow through and to protect our people, protect our wildlife and protect our natu a, a rich natural heritage. And so uh, that is the best strategy we have in this country for uh, protecting our wildlife and, and uh, habitat. It's not waiting for the species to arrive and then spending millions of dollars trying to eradicate them. We know that that largely is extremely costly and very unlikely to succeed. Look what's going on with the feral pigs, with the nutria, with the, uh, the list goes on and on, the brown tree snake. We have so many invasive species in this country that are causing billions of dollars of damage to our economy. The zebra mussel in the Great Lakes, yeah. the list goes on and on, and there is no strategy for eradicating. So if we now have an opportunity to take a look and say, what are the, what's the next wave look like? Are we going to do something about it when it's not expensive to us and much more likely to be, be effective? And the answer is absolutely yes. The Lacey Act is the best tool we have for controlling invasive species. Right. And, and if I may also say, um, Mr. Wyatt stated earlier um, that because of the cold winters of 2009 and um, to 2010, 30 to 50 percent of invasive Burmese python population in South Africa, Florida died. Um, but by your own arithmetic or math, um, 50 percent, 50 to 70 percent of these snakes, um, which are not supposed to be there in the first place, survive, right? So, um, Mr. Kostiak, what would happen if we had a string of warmer than average winters? Uh, isn't it possible that? 30% won't die and 100% will survive and each one would have, like Ms. Bernalio say, 50 babies, snakes, and... Right? I mean, that's exactly. exactly right. No, I'm asking him a question, not okay. you, Mr. Wyatt. Uh, so, uh, briefly, uh, my organization considers climate change to be one of the largest threats to, uh, to wildlife and, and people in this country. And uh, so we're well versed in the science. And the trend line we've seen in the past 20 years is going to continue, which is increasingly winters are going to become warmer, uh, and, and globally temperatures are going to continue to increase. And so we can be smart and start preparing for that change, or we can put our head in the sand. Yeah. If we want to prepare for that change, we have to understand that the range of species that have historically been tropical will continue to shift northward. And there's, a, 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 I can, I'm very and happy I'm, to provide. And I'm going to make a fool out of myself here. Here we have actually inviting invasive species and at the same time, we're trying to close the border and tell everybody who's here with undocumented aliens to leave. And you know, I'm just confused here. Maybe it's because I'm from the islands and I'm naive about national politics. But welcome to the pets. I mean, the invasive animals and kick out the human beings. I'm just uh, my time's up, Mr. Chairman. I made a fool out of myself already. Uh, the, <clears throat> the gentleman yields back. Um, if uh, the panel is up for it, we'll go through another row of questions, and uh, we appreciate uh, your patience with us. Uh, let me say, uh, parenthetically, uh, with regard to a statement that Mr. Sutherland made about the laws and the burdens of the law, uh, it's interesting, uh, we had hearings last year, I believe it was, on uh, what happened to Gibson Guitar. Uh, who had $50 million worth of wood confiscated as contraband. No charges were filed. The uh, country of origin of the wood said no laws were broken. No one ever actually claimed a law was broken. And uh, by law, there was no access to the court uh, by Gibson. And again, in a down economy, the last thing in the world we want to be doing is harming our, our, our companies and corporations. Um, with respect to uh, Florida, um, Mr. Heflick, um, what, what has the state of Florida done to address this? And before you answer, I want to circumscribe the fact here that regardless of all the discussion about snakes can hibernate and they can, they can find shelter and all this, the truth is that even though there may be 10 or 20 percent of offspring that may be a little hardier 
uh, all they've got to do is to travel to a slightly cooler uh, climate and they're going to die too. So there, there may be a buffer zone there, but it's very clear these snakes at the present time are very much restricted to the very, very lowest latitude of the United States. And no one's, despite all the rhetoric today, no one has produced any proof that, uh, that these snakes can migrate northward and survive. So, um, so it's important to know what Florida is doing and has done. Yes, sir. Florida Wildlife Commission, which is charged with that, um, <clears throat> has done a lot. And I actually worked hand in hand with them in putting out these new regulations, which consist of um, increased security for cages. Now, there's a special permit now required um, for these animals and that you must be an approved facility, an approved breeder, um, to be able to work with these animals. There are transport regulations now that we have stepped up, including double bagging and putting into to an additional container that is secured in case there's a car accident or the like. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, they've really gone really over and above to get a handle on this. And it has really bottlenecked the market of these snakes down to about 95%. You don't see the commerce in them. You don't see the trade, the values down. So it is it has really hurt the market, but Florida, which is obviously the, the ground zero and epicenter of this, has, has taken great strides in increasing the regulations um, and controls on these species. And and you're right about the, uh, the buffer zone. Um, you're you're talking to somebody who I've been boots on the ground and I apologize to my other witnesses here who are using other people's testimonies within theirs. But in 2009, 2010, that winter, we saw countless carcasses, carcass after carcass after carcass after carcass of these Burmese pythons dead in the Everglades. And the figures that they're putting out there, 30 to, to 50 percent, um, I have first-hand knowledge of those, and those were put out to be conservative. And really, when you look at the studies, my study, 100% of the animals dead in four days. When you look at Frank Mazzotti, who is one of the individuals that does the, 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 rela or the, um, the tracking of these Burmese pythons and some of the vast majority of the studies on them, 90% of his animals that were tracked during that winter, dead. And the, and the one that did survive was because they found it before it could die, they brought it in, and then later on, subsequently, it died, died from secondary causes of the cold. So these numbers that you're throwing out, about 40%, 30%, are conservative at best. Right. Well, let, let me, uh, I just, I'd love to hear more, but for sake of time, let me ask you another question. Let's say that I own a constrictor in Florida and it's too big I can't handle it what can I do as a pet owner or a pet store owner we have a 24 7 amnesty program um, where designated locations I myself am one that have been certified by FWC anybody at any time no questions asked can donate that animal um, to get it into a safe um, facility and um, it's working. I, I get those and other facilities and, do. And let me follow up with that. Uh, how many people, if any, do you see driving from other parts of the country dumping their snakes in um, the Everglades? There has never been one record, even anecdotal, of someone being arrested, pulled over, being caught, filmed, videoed, you name it, of dumping a snake in the Everglades. Well, now, sir, are you sure there haven't been snakes to crawl from Utah all the way down to the Everglades? Perhaps that could happen. That is a long trip. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Well, thank you, and my time is out, and uh, Mr. Sullivan, I recognize him for fun. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I made, um, uh, you made a point about Gibson uh, and the, uh, the hearing we had. I know over in agriculture, uh, we had a few years ago, we had a, someone died um, from eating a pepper. And uh, so the FDA shut down uh, pepper farmers uh, down in my district. Um, peppers had already been harvested, and, and uh, well, they were harvesting them, you know, at, at the time. 
um, and they made them destroy their entire harvest. Um, and so they, they they were not allowed to file any insurance claims, um, and they were able, so they, they were just out an entire harvest, an entire year. Many of these farmers went out of business, um, and um, only to find out that the pepper came from Mexico. Uh, those farmers uh, had no recovery. Um, Mrs. Sutherland, you have a small business. I have a small business. And um, much of the federal government could care less about your business. They could care less about our business. I appreciate uh, minority witnesses here today and, and your trust in giving um, the federal government uh, greater latitude and, and greater ability to be able to put downward pressure on freedom. Uh, but um, if I've learned anything over the short 23 months that I've been here, uh, is that a government big enough to meet all of your needs is a government big enough to take everything you own. Welcome to the nightmare that one of our founding fathers quoted 240 years ago. Um, this appears to me, Mr. Chairman, to look like a, be a, a solution looking for a problem. This is ridiculous. With all the problems we have in this country, this is, I, I, I'm, I'm dumbfounded. I mean, we, we've got $90 trillion of unfunded mandates in our entitlement programs. I don't want to diminish what you do, but we got we got bigger fish to fry here, okay, than to, to target businesses, small businesses like Mrs. Sutherland and other small businesses around this country. Um, it's open season on business. It's open season on enterprise. It's open season on freedom, and um, uh, I, I we, you know, I think we can make quick work of this. This is a solution looking for a problem. I yield back, which is very rare, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, indeed, it is, Mr. <laughs> Sullivan. Uh, to yield back early like this, but you, you owe it back to us anyway. So we'll, we'll take it. Add it to my account. Uh, and but we ask that in the future you be a little more passionate about the things you believe in. Well, that's... <laughs> uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman, Mr. Sublime, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the amendment. Mr. Costia, you're the lawyer, so I gotta go to you. This is some. I'm not blaming you for being a lawyer. I'm just holding you accountable for being. <laughs> I'm a recovering lawyer, I should say. So, if someone's driving a car and causes an accident and kills someone, they can be charged with manslaughter, despite not knowingly setting out to kill that person. And so that's why we have laws, traffic laws, right? And regulations. Isn't the Lacey Act the equivalent of traffic laws in a sense? Yeah, it, it, it right now is what is known as a strict liability statute, which is uh, it does not require knowledge uh, of a violation of the law. It doesn't require knowledge of the chain reaction effect that if you uh, sell this pet and the pet owner might accidentally release the animal or intentionally release the animal that it could end up uh, you know, causing millions of dollars of damage all across our economy and destroying our environment. That's the effect, but we don't expect people to know all those facts before we enforce the law. And we don't expect a prosecutor to have uh, a, the ability to prove what's in somebody's mind, uh, those complex facts. That's the way our laws operate. And let's face it, if we didn't have it that way, if we didn't have strict liability statutes, we would not have been able to enforce a large part of the laws that uh, regulate uh, BP and its uh, release of massive uh, destruction of the Gulf of Mexico with the oil spill two years ago. Those are strict liability statutes that has enabled the federal government to hold BP accountable. And so the, the, turning it around here and creating this impossible burden of proof is essentially saying we don't care about the Lacey Act. We don't expect it to be enforced. Well, actually, it's a way around, but um, let me, um, um, Ms. Sutherland, good morning, hi. Um, please, I, I don't want to inter interfere in how you run your business. We all need to learn, uh, earn a living, and, you know, I commend you for your business, unlike some of us who are in Congress. We, I'll leave it there, but 
they just let me just one example. I was at home and then I, I found out that Twinkies are gonna be stopped being sold. Twinkies. I mean, the last time I had Twinkies was when I was in basic training, and they actually told me to stop eating the stuff because I was overweight. But that doesn't mean that store owners now are gonna go broke because Twinkies are being stopped, right? I mean, we're talking here about nine species. I mean, actually, now it's only five. You can adopt, adapt to, I mean, I'm not just, I'm not, you know, other businesses can adapt to the change. That's what business do, right? Otherwise, there's no reason for anyone to be in business. You're not telling me that the only things you sell are these nine species, where now it's five, actually, are you? No, I'm not saying that. Um, we do have an ancillary business. We breed rodents. I supply one of the largest breeders of boas in my state with rodents for his boas. That amounts to approximately $52,000 a year. And that helps pay for my employees that work in the rodent rooms. And so, yes, it's true that businesses do learn to adapt. However, there are other circumstances other than, well, you can just change a snake. No, I have to change out all the caging, and then I have to find a buyer for that caging. And there are limits. You know, one of the things that goes along with this that hasn't been raised is bow constrictors, and reticulated pythons, are owned by, I mean boas more than the retics, are owned by thousands of private citizens across the United States. If they are added to the Lacey Act, they will unknowingly break the Lacey Act by moving from one state to another because the general public does not follow all the minute rules and regulations that are enacted yeah, I'm every gonna year. I'm going to reclaim my time, Ms. Sal. Thank you. I really appreciate your response. Uh, Mr. Jenkins, um, you see, where I come from, we, have, um, we advertise on TV and the paper, if you see a snake, kill it, then report it. So you kill it first and ask questions later. But Mr. Jenkins, many of the witnesses have talked about the only problem, about this only being a problem in South Florida. However, insular areas like, you know, where I'm from, the territories, or as my home, are both warm enough to support these snakes and are particularly vulnerable to invasive species. Some of these snakes have already been found in, in the wild in Puerto Rico. Can you address the potential cost of these snakes to U.S. territories? Absolutely. Um, and. Uh, it just seems as if a lot of the discussion from Mr. Helflich, Mr. Barr, and some of the discussion has been this idea that the snakes are going to crawl northward in Florida and invade the rest of the country. Well, that's not how it's going to happen. We know, and there's an excellent report from the Humane Society that's in the record, that there are hundreds and hundreds of reports of releases around the country where these owners have the snakes, they let them go or they escape. We don't know exactly how the snakes get out, but it's in the media. We know there are hundreds of cases in 45 states and the island territories around the country. So yeah, the snakes aren't going to crawl to South Texas or right. to the territories. And, and I agree They're going to get released there. And just because just Mr. Heflick has never heard of a case doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Just because he hasn't seen anyone it, it's uh, documented. go on, stop, I mean, go on a red light doesn't mean that nobody's done it today. It's, it's all I'm saying. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My time's up. And when yields his time back, um, well, let's see. We'd like to maybe ask a few more questions. Um, so thank you again for your patience. I now yield uh, myself five minutes, uh, Mr. Heflick. Um, now, there's been a lot of discussion about a lot of people killed, de injured. Uh, we heard children uh, constricted in their cribs and all of this as a result of constrictors uh, that may have been brought into this country. Um, with regard to constrictors in the wild, which is really what we're talking about here in the Everglades, how many humans have been uh, killed as a result of that? In the approximate two decades that the Burmese pythons have been in the wilds of South Florida, the uh, cumulative numbers of humans killed, attacked, is zero. Okay. Uh, would it surprise you to know that there are over 200,000 Americans who are taken to the emergency room each year as a result of injuries and even death from dogs? 
It wouldn't surprise me. And there are also additionally 30,000 that require plastic surgery. Most of those are in the age range between four years and nine years of age. So if you were to compare constrictors versus uh, dogs, uh, which would you consider to be more injurious? I've worked with both. <laughs> and um, I, have, I have sustained major injuries from man's best friend. Um, and minor minor scrapes and scratches from the wild pythons that I've encountered around the world. Right. So let me see if I can summarize a little information here. We understand that these imported uh, constrictors, they're ectothermal, which means that they cannot survive in cold weather. Um, as far as we know, they're completely encapsulated into the Everglades. Regardless of where they may have been released, they only survive in the Everglades. Um, Florida has apparently a very robust system not only of preventing them getting into the wild, but uh, certainly an amnesty program that I think is very fair, that you can give them up without any concern about repercussions. And so Florida is handling a Florida problem that only exists in Florida. Uh, do you do you see any problem with that, sir? No, I think that this is very much so a state issue. Mm -hmm. And Florida, which happens to be the epicenter yeah. for this, is handling it. They've gone above and beyond. Um, and ultimately, this talk about constrictors and invasives invading the rest of the country, whether released, escaped accidentally, or taking their time to slither north... Um, is in my biological opinion so absurd so uh, you see no reason to pass a federal law that would apply to 50 states and territories for a problem that's not only limited just to Florida but to a very small area of Florida that's correct okay thank you for that uh, shifting topics a little bit uh, we heard I think it was mr. Jenkins testify that boa constrictors are uh, an invasive species to Puerto Rico, um, but our information is that they are native to Puerto Rico, uh, certain species are, and they are listed on the endangered species list. Mr. Wyatt, do you have any information on this? There are insular boas that are native uh, to uh, Puerto Rico. They are different um, from uh, boa constrictor, which we're, we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. um, and so it would, uh, because it is so far south, I do believe that, the, that they would probably be able to survive in Puerto Rico if they were introduced there and, and, mm -hmm. and, and establish themselves. But I would uh, uh, guess that Puerto Rico and other uh, insular territories of, of the United States as well as any state can pass laws to 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 uh, to restrict those animals in that state so, where they so may Puerto be Puerto Rico could do the same thing Florida has done absolutely okay uh, and just in the small amount of time I have left just a general comment and that is you know the framers of the Constitution created our government in which uh, the the powers and the rights of the federal government would be circumscribed, would be limited, and that all other powers would go to the states. Uh, and again, I, I see this as a very, very limited uh, geographical problem within a state that is a very competent to handle the problem. And I think it, it simply goes against, um, you know, the, the, the uh, traditions much less the laws and the Constitution of the United States to create such a uh, an over, overreach in law that really affects only a small part of this nation. And with that, I yield back and I recognize the gentleman from Florida for any questions he has. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> you know, one of the things that seems um, in, in trying to solve, I guess, perceived problems, uh, so oftentimes the federal government just creates bigger problems. Um, it's really amazing to me, coming from a business background. Um, and yet we continue to appropriate more money for the incompetence of creating more problems. Um, I'm just curious, one of the unintended consequences, and it's just common sense, I'm a common sense kind of guy, um, it served me well, is that if you have 
this bill becomes law, you're going to have individuals in a transit society that we live in now. Uh, my goodness, people are are um, they're transferred. You've got military bases. You've got. I mean, we move a lot, um, and, and so it seems to me that you would be further exasperating the problem of people saying, "Okay, I've now been." relocated and transferred and I've got this this snake and so and because it has very little value can't sell it Miss Sutherland you know can't can't afford to buy it because she's fighting for her very life I mean she, it's, it's it's worthless uh, as far as a marketable value that we're just gonna we're just gonna dump it out it seems to me that that's an unintended consequence of this bill, and now we have further exasperated the problem uh, by, um, by by increasing our numbers uh, of, of snakes that, um, you know, were... And, and I'm just curious, uh, uh, Mr. Heflick, what, uh, am I right? I mean, you seem like a common-sense kind of guy. You could, you, I, I'd love to spend a Saturday with you. Um, the, um, is, that a, is that a fair... Yeah, I major, I do major in common sense too, so that's why. But um, you're exactly right. And, and the addition of the Burmese python, um, which has already happened, has done exactly that. It has trapped all of the existing Burmese pythons in the one state where they present a problem, in the south of Florida. And so you're exactly right. By, by making this a Lacey Act listing, you trap all of these animals in those states. You decrease their marketable value. You actually make them have a negative value because you still have to feed them. You have to maintain them. You have to take care of them. Man hours. You know, as a as a business owner, how that how that works. Yeah. So that's exactly what it's done. And through personal comments with with uh, biologists and that in the state of Florida that work for the state of Florida on this project, they feel the same way. And it, it has um, it is overreached, and it's causing problems in the states that they are better suited to handle themselves if left alone. So you're exactly correct, Dr. Barr. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, it's it's perpetuating the problem, not solving. I think does it uh, uh, Hawaii, which is a tropical subtropical area, has some of the, the most stringent exotic animal laws uh, in existence. And that's how they've chosen to dealt with their problem. And I think that it, it, it is working. Mr. Wyatt? And, and your yes, sir. And, uh, back to your, your point of unintended consequences. There's other unintended co consequences uh, aside from that. And you brought up the military and transient society. This is the first time ever that, that the government has sought to uh, list animals so widely held by the American public. And the, the, like Ms. Sutherland said, not everybody out there is aware of what's going on with all this stuff. We pay close attention because we have business interests here. But your, your average owner, take for instance, say someone who is deployed to Afghanistan. He comes back from his deployment, he's stationed in California, and uh, they get, they get uh, transferred to North Carolina. Okay, He and his wife pack up, and they've got a pet boa constrictor, and they cross all these state lines to get over to North Carolina. He has just unknowingly become a Lacey Fa Act felon numerous times over, subject to thousands of dollars in fines and prison time. And uh, this is, this is a, a, a situation that could be repeated over and over and over again. And it's just, it's uh, unconscionable that, that, that such an action would be taken and put all these private citizens at risk because they had a boa constrictor as a pet. You know, I, I find it, 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 it must be difficult for a situation like you just described for a soldier to, uh, uh, it seems like, be kind of anti-soldier. Uh, that uh, you've got a soldier now that's got a that's got a flag on his arm and he's going to serve and now he's 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 been in violation because of the knowingly part uh, uh, of of this bill. So um, look, you you've hit it. This is this is uh, so I yield back close to time, Mr. Chairman. Okay, very good. Uh, I thank the gentleman uh, and panel. Um, uh, we may have some additional uh, questions, uh, but we'll submit those in writing and and certainly. We'll ask the subcommittee members to do that. 
Um, the hearing record will be open for 10 days to receive uh, these responses uh, that you may provide to those questions. In addition, I also want to submit for the record a statement from the American Bird Conservancy, an economic study from the Georgetown Economic Services. A number of emails I've received in opposition to H.R. 511 and three scientific studies which have conclusively demonstrated that these constrictor snakes cannot, let me repeat, cannot survive outside of South Florida without objection so ordered. I want to thank members and staff for their contributions to this hearing. Before adjourning, I would like to wish a happy birthday to one of our committee staff, Ms. Bonnie Bruce, and uh, you're welcome to volunteer your age. <laughs> oh, without objection. <laughs> um, who has served with this, with distinction and uh, for the past 18 years, and we thank you for your service, Bonnie. If there's no further business, without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned.